running live anyway. So I'm checking us on the phone, Brother Caleb. I've got special guests with us tonight, Brother Caleb Hewling, and he is pastor of, is it Trinity? Trinity Bible Baptist Church. That, that's what I thought, Trinity Bible Baptist Church in Trinidad, Trinidad, Trinidad yes. Colorado. So we're up and running. Oh, and it looks like I, I didn't even do this. We've even got um, little captions on here, brother. How about that? Yeah, I'm surprised that they can even pick up what I'm saying. It, <laughs> you must have the disaster. Southern turned on. Yeah, well, it's a disaster just trying to work with Siri, you know. <laughs> I can't tell you how many cuss words that I've sent to preachers. And, you know, didn't even mean to, but uh, it, it can't uh, can't quite pick up this accent here. Likely, so, likely excuse, brother Randy. Likely yeah. excuse. Yeah, sure, sure. Now, where are you from originally? I was born in Western New York, in between Buffalo and Rochester. I moved to Virginia when I was eleven, and then moved down to Happy Valley Baptist Church in Villarica, Georgia, when I was seventeen, and that's where I call home. Okay. All right. Well, I knew that somehow you ended up in the South. So praise the Lord. Yeah. All right. Well, we're doing a broadcast tonight. Uh, I see that Caleb Hickam is watching. I see that Andrew Sluter is watching. This is the upgrade from Andrew Sluter. Oh, uh, that. Well, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he's out. He's out preaching. And, and I'm not sure if we're allowed to say that. He, he just asked a question. Uh, this question coming in from Andrew Sluter. Why is Caleb Hewling a hyper dispensationalist? So, so let me explain that question real fast. I was doing a question and answer on my uh, church page one Sunday night. And um, my newest brother-in-law, Micaiah Young, his Facebook got hijacked by Brother Andrew. And uh, and he wrote on there, he said, why is Andrew Sluter a hyper dispensationalist on my broadcast? And I was like, oh, I'm not really going to get into that. You know, I just well, you should. You across should the board. The real question is, why is he one as Pentecostal? Yeah, that's it. That's the real question. Uh, we were uh, well, you know, about the whole thing with with Andrew, like the whole blow up over the Trinity and. Uh, you, you know, Andrew believes in the Trinity, but there were some guys that allegedly. were jealous. And I, uh, allegedly, yes, believes in the Trinity. We were preaching together up in Michigan, and we were at this little church uh, on Mackinac Island. And the name of the church was Trinity Baptist Church. And Andrew, he said if he was the pastor, it'd be Unity Baptist. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that's hope, funny. Hope those guys get a hold of that. So we're talking about something tonight uh, that really we, we don't normally deal with on the broadcast. We we deal with, um, you know, just a, a lot of general Bible questions. We've dealt with uh, a lot of crazy, crazy stuff. I was actually changing the crawler and the agenda and everything and deleting the words cryptozoology off man eating animals. I was deleting that off. That was from one we're supposed to do with Caleb Hickam. I was getting rid of all that stuff. Tonight we're talking about balance. And um, brother, I, I think that you are well qualified to talk about this subject. Uh, you've got a good pastor and, uh, you know, he was a great influence to you. And yes, I would say that my pastor was also an influence to you as well. And I, I don't know many people that are as balanced as as my pastor is. Uh, my pastor, Brother I, Tony Shirley of New Man of Baptist Church, for those who don't know. I agree with that. Um, in fact, he's probably um, one of the uh, the men who have influenced me uh, in this area the greatest. Uh, somebody well, that can that can, you know, love the Lord and be excited about it. Sure, sure. Well, you know, he was able to accomplish bringing in, you know, somewhat the best of all of the crowds. 
and, and being able to accommodate that. And, and you know, he, uh, you know, his ears are probably burning right now, us talking about him. But, uh, you know, he, he's preached for several guys across the spectrum. Uh, you know, a, a lot of guys are generally pigeonholed to one group of individuals. Um, and a lot of that is by our own doing, you know, if I were to be completely honest. But, um, you know, he, he's been able to kind of span the gap. And, and I do believe it's because of his balanced nature. Now, if anybody wants to ask any questions off the topic, we're not talking about this all night. But if you want to throw some questions out there, I guarantee you that Brother Hewling is a Bible student, okay? And he's going to answer all the questions you ask tonight. So if you got a question, go ahead and throw it out there. We may get to some of that stuff we were talking about the other night um, about the day of the Lord. Because absolutely, I, I know that our crowd, the guys who watch us, they'll eat that up. But we need to we need to slide a little bit of this balance in under the radar. Well, we can absolutely get to anything else um, on there when you we were discussing the idea of a topic. Um, you know, I I I am not the what you say cryptozoology uh, expert that Caleb Hickam is by any stretch of the imagination, uh, man eating beasts and the such like. But uh, but I do I do love the Word of God and I enjoy the idea of giving an, an answer, um, people having questions and being able to respond. So, so we'll take questions from anywhere as far as that goes scripturally uh, and try to, you know, to answer that way. But I really did want to have the conversation with you um, about balance specifically uh, because you hit the nail on the head, I believe, uh, there with the, you called it pigeonholing ourselves into uh, they're referred to as camps or circles or uh, the such like. And and my question to you is is have we have we become so divided that we have that we have totally lost our ability to be balanced in disagreement? And that is really what I wanted to uh, to spend some time kind of hashing out with you because uh, some of this stuff's hard, really hard to to discern where we're supposed to be in our balance, honestly. Sure. Well, and, and you know, a lot of times when guys talk about balance, uh, and by the way, everybody needs to like and share this really quick, okay? We need your help liking and sharing tonight. But, um, you, you know, a lot of times when you say balance, people automatically think compromise. And, and that's not what we're saying at all. Um, we're, we're not even saying that you have to give up necessarily a certain position that you have. But, uh, you know, this whole deal with the coronavirus, this was a perfect example to show us uh, how quickly people can get unbalanced and how quickly um, they can eat other people up who disagree with them. Absolutely. Uh, without question, I, that's actually a great point that you made. Um, when we talk about balance, I really think that the, if you would, the straw man of the argument People try to make it to be a, you know, half one way, half the other as the balance. But the reality is it needs to be 100 percent in the middle in order to be balanced. Um, we're not we're not, you know, kind of this way, kind of that way, twofold or double minded. But it's really just 100 percent on where God has it in line and then being able to, uh, you know, to rest kind of in that in that mindset is really what I view as as being properly balanced. So let me put you on the spot a, a little bit because, you know, most guys, if you ask them if they're balanced, they're going to say that they are. Um, that's the nature of us. Uh, sure. You know, none of us are hyper anything. You, you know, we're all moderate. We're all where we need to be. Um, you know, I, I've heard some of the most hyper of hyper Calvinists say, no, I'm just I'm a moderate Calvinist. And I remember one guy telling me about. Spurgeon fighting the hyper Calvinist, and I had to stop him. And I said, "Wait a second, brother! I need you to explain to me what you think a hyper Calvinist is, because he was one." Uh, you mm -hmm. know, so we all kind of view ourselves as being moderate or balanced. Um, what would you say are some ways maybe that we could check ourselves on that, um, and maybe bring into our lives more of a balance in our ministry? 
Well, I, I think that one of the key ways uh, for us to be balanced is, uh, and this will help kind of an across the board, uh, you know, answer to this topic in our in our ministries is really if we're just focused on what we are doing for the Lord and not worrying about other people. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times that's really the quickest way to get out of balance is when we start worrying about, you know, another man's servant, uh, I believe. Yeah. But you're right. Everybody's balanced. You know, it doesn't matter if they're missing the wheel, not just out of balance, but it's just completely off the car. They're still going to say, well, no, we're balanced. Uh, absolutely. I do think, um, you know, the, when I always deal with balance, I talk about, um, you know, John 4, that God's a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We talk about having the right doctrine, but also the right disposition, you know, the right truth, but also the right spirit. And you find those things all throughout scripture. The Old Testament talks about mercy and truth regularly. The New Testament talks about it. Uh, you know, you'll hear people that will stand up and and yell and scream and holler, you know, at somebody to speak the truth and bless God. I'm speaking the truth. And if you don't like it, you can lump it. But they missed that the last part of the verses in love. It's speaking the truth in love. And, and without that, the spirit, the charity, which is the bond of perfectness, I think that's what ties it all together. And that is really um really what 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 will declare to us whether we are or are not uh moderate or balanced is because if any man love god the same is known of him mm -hmm. and so and so in that mindset you know when philippians 4 talks about let your moderation be made known among all men um if you're moderate it'll it'll come through and I, it's kind of like I, I i say regularly about you know young men if you're 16 years old you know, the guy who's running around telling everybody, I'm a man, you know, I'm a man, I'm a man. No, you're not. If you have to tell everybody, you're not there yet. But if you'll just sure. be quiet and good about your business and, you know, be mature, uh, other people will will see in you that, oh, you're a man. And so they will be the ones that are able to declare it. Kind of like what you did as soon as we got on this topic. You said, Tony Shirley, that man's balanced. Mm -hmm. And I think you're that's really... That's really where the, the litmus test, if you would, for me. So I, I've got a question that came in on balance from Joseph Deering. I, I'm not sure I understand you, Joseph. I might need you to rephrase this. Um, he, he says, should you count verses to establish the right balance? Uh, do, you, do you make heads or tails of that? I, I don't. Hey, uh, do you Joseph, are, are you asking kind of like... Uh, you know, people, which this isn't true, but this is an example how people say that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did heaven type deal. Like, are you asking if you should count up percentages wise? Uh, I'm not quite sure of the question. Re-ask it for us. But um, so, yeah, when we're talking about balance, that is something that really it's really the thing that kind of creates a lot of the camps that we have. Now, we're not going to eradicate camps and circles on this broadcast tonight, but nor am I have, trying to. Right. They're, they're always going to be there. And, um, it, you know, it, it's just something that we're always going to deal with. But, you know, you've got your your house type guys. And they always lean heavily into the the soul winning. And then you've got your your Ruckman or you or you could put Harold Seitler in there for the guys who don't like Ruckman. But Harold Seitler, man, he was a Bible student. You got those guys and they lean more towards the studious side. And, and then you've got your camp meeting guys that just like to run around and shout, um, you, you know, if we could somehow find a point that we could take all of those good things, and Andrew and I have talked about this many times on the broadcast, if we could bring in all of those good things, you know, that's one way that we could find balance. It's absolutely it's our imbalance that creates a lot of the circles that we are in. Absolutely. And and one of the problems with that is we become so fixated on people's problem or their fault that we cannot acknowledge where they're good or right in. Mm -hmm. um, and God forbid that somebody who's wrong in this area 
has this other area better than I do. You know, that just can't happen. Sure. And that and that is, I think, why we're running into these same things, because because if they're this way and that's wrong, then then I don't want any part of it when that's an imbalance. And I think it's a, a tool of the devil to try to keep us from from, you know, preaching the whole counsel of God, uh, from loving the Lord with all our heart, all our soul. You know, that's a, a, an all in 100 percent kind of thing that we ought to be good in all of those areas. Mm -hmm. But I had a guy tell me at a meeting that I was preaching, um, he said that one of the reasons that he could never get on board with dispensationalism, and he was coming at it from a house perspective, he was a house graduate. Um, he told me one of the reasons that he could never get on board with dispensationalists were because generally they all have a rotten attitude. <laughs> and that that's not a good reason, but... That was his reason. He, he said he just couldn't get on board with people that had that kind of attitude. Well, I think that goes back to something that you and I have discussed in the past, and that is that that which is of God should resemble him. And and, you know, we might have truth, but we we think that that is somehow the highest uh, ideal for a child of God. When the reality is, is holding the truth is not. Uh, what is the highest ideal, but living it is. Yeah. Because, you know, if you would just look at the uh, the Matthew uh, parable of the uh, the servants, you know, the one who had the most knowledge was the wicked and slothful servant. He said, I knew that thou art an austere man. He's the only one that claimed and boasted of his knowledge of the of the master, but he was the one that was treated or was judged the most harsh because mm -hmm. it wasn't about what we know. It's about what you do with it. Sure. Well, and, and another point that we could add to that, I heard a young preacher say this one time. Uh, he said that his, his uh, talent, what was given to him was also the cleanest of all the others too. He took it, he wrapped it up and he hid it. So mm -hmm. he, he was the cleanest uh, boasted of intellect and, uh, you know, was the one that did get judged the harshest. I was reading one guy's comments today, and, and he said that a lot of people are no longer Bible believers in the sense that they once were as far as being soldiers for the Lord, but now we're part of the debate team. And mm -hmm. that that does seem where we are. It's a good illustration. Everybody's so busy with, with the infighting that there's not really much going forward as far as reaching out. So I think that this is something we should watch uh, and be careful for. Okay, let me circle back around to Joseph Deering. He was talking about kind of what I was saying, counting verses. For example, there are verses where Jesus is being meek and other verses where he is angrily rebuking. So he's asking if if you think maybe a good way to find balance is find biblical examples of, of that. And I guess somewhat divide them up for a mindset, kind of like you've heard guys talk about reproof, rebuke and, and exhortation. So mm -hmm. our, our preaching should be two thirds reproof and rebuke. Uh, what do you think about that thought? Um, well, I, I'd say our preaching should be two thirds rebuke. If our people are two thirds bad, um, <laughs> You know, there are time and place for everything. You know, the, the shepherd knows or ought to know the state of his flock and ought to be able to, uh, the Holy Spirit for sure does. And, and as he leads and guides, uh, you know, different seasons ought to produce different uh, food, you mm -hmm. know, from the man of God, for sure. Um, one of the things, Brother Deering, uh, that I'll tell you is Revelation 5 to me is one of the, uh, one of the, most incredible verses on balance with from the Lord that you're going to find. And that is in verse number five of Revelation five, they say, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then when you turn around in verse six, he looks and he sees him. And I beheld low in the midst of the throne of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Mm. And I love that they declare, behold, the lion and he sees a lamb. Yeah, you amen. say, why? Because he's balanced. He, he's a hundred percent. Lion, 100% lamb, um, and, and knowing when to be both is absolutely a key uh, ingredient. That discernment 
is without a doubt a necessary part of balance, brother. Absolutely. Sure. Well, I've got uh, another statement here. This is from Glenda Renasia. She's one of uh, our watchers from China. And she says, interesting study past few days, brethren talk about balance. They are arguing with it. And I just be silent because I don't have knowledge a lot yet about balance. So exactly. It's a great thing to hear. Um, when I saw her say that, that there are times that she's just quiet when she doesn't know. Sister, you'd be surprised at how wise that you can, um, how wise you can look just by being silent. Uh, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to express an opinion on everything. Man, I'm telling you, brother, there's times, especially when I, I scroll Twitter. Now, Facebook, it riles me up some, but Twitter, apparently that's where the big boys go to fight. I had to get <laughs> off Twitter. It yes. did not help my spirit. I, I honestly, I had to get off Twitter um, yeah. for two reasons. One, the primary reason was that the more I read, and I only had preachers that were, you know, that I was following and men of God who ought to know better saying some really foolish things. It just bothered me. It really well, did. It I got to the point every time I would scroll, cause man, I always wanted to say something. And then, you know, you feel bad cause you're going to say something to them and start a fight. So you want to like type passive aggressively, like, you, you know, just kind of put something and hope that they read it later. A and I just finally came to the point that that's just like taking a dog by the ears. Like Proverbs says, you know, yes, meddling in strife that's not ours. And it, it like grabbing a dog by the ears and, and how many times, uh, do we have to get bit in life to realize, OK, there's some things that we just need to stay out of some things that uh, uh, that, yeah, they do merit a response, but not everything. So Chip Party, he asked this question and this is a good question. This is legitimate because um, like we mentioned, when we opened up a lot of guys, when they say balance. Now, I do know a lot and you know a lot of guys that use the term balance, but they use it to justify their compromise. Sure. So he says, what are the main distinguishers between balance and compromise? What are your thoughts on that? Um, uh, in, in a somewhat of a nutshell, I'm going to say a balanced person will have, uh, will be, will be increasingly like God. And so I, I say it this way, that which tendeth to holiness is of the Lord, um, or that which is of the Lord tends to holiness. So, so we ought to be striving personally to be more like God. But on the, on the, on the, the, the treating people side, we ought to be more like God in the long suffering and in extending grace. And a lot of times where people might have the right even if you want to call it a standard for themselves, they will exact the same standard on others in a way that is not how the Lord did. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the Pharisees who were getting on to people for not washing their hands. It wasn't Jesus. It was the Pharisees who were constantly, hey, why this? Why that? It was the Judases that were, why aren't you selling this? You know, it was they were so focused on others instead of uh, just being being what they were supposed to be. And then allowing the the Lord, you know, to deal with with other people as He sees fit. Mm -hmm. So uh, you may not have an answer to what I'm going to ask you, and if you don't, that's perfectly fine. But what do you think? And maybe it's a case by case basis. But do you think that there are some times that we can say yes, that definitely merits a response. That definitely merits a rebuke. Um, in in a public setting because you know a lot of dumb things are being said publicly right now so that's a great a great thing how do you find the balance between um you know mark them and and paul said in philippians that he rejoiced that the gospel was preached even by those that were preaching of contention mm -hmm. those seem to be two totally different mindsets um you know so so there is an all things to all men type of a, a mindset that we need to have. And and it is it is that case by case, um, you know, believing that that you are doing what God would have for you to do. Um, 
and 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 then being comfortable that not everybody is, has to know that if yeah. we're if we're do Paul talked a lot about having a conscience void of offense or a clear conscience or a clean conscience toward God. Um, that is the key to this thing, I believe, is is when you're the, the balance has to be that our relationship with God is where everything else stems out of. And a lot of times we we try to, you know, um, add a little bit of God to a little bit of family time and a little bit of this, when in reality, the proper balance is that it all springs from springs from uh, our relationship with the Lord and our walk with God. And then it flows into those other areas. Mm. Amen. Well, OK, so there are several questions coming in on balance. I honestly didn't think we would be getting the amount of questions that we are. Um, so if, if we don't get to talk about the day of the Lord, you've got some really good stuff on that. And so, uh, we'll get you in again, uh, next time, uh, a Andrew's not able to be on the broadcast, but we'll take as much time on this topic as we need. Cause I do think this is important to have a discussion about, um, Neela Montero says there are many so-called Christians that have a good doctrine, but no manifestations in their walk or lack in practical application. I do agree with that. Um, Gabriel, Gabriel Gonzalez, go would ahead. you say, would you say that that kind of plays in part? I hope I answered to Brother Chip when he asked that question earlier. Um, that 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 the main distinguishing characteristic between balance and compromise is a proper balance is going to look more like God, and a compromise will be a walking away from God. I think that's a good answer. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because a lot of the times the, the guys who are compromising and they're using balance as, you, you know, the means to cover it up. Uh, it, it's overtly obvious that they're trying to do more to feed their flesh. Well, because the compromise is this, Brother Randy, I really believe that that let's say we had an extreme, uh, even in just in our movement, we had an extreme that was over here. You know, if you want to call it. Uh, militant fundamentalism let's just use the term that you know that and this was the extreme and people are trying to run away from it they don't want to come to balance and be in the middle what they're doing is they're swinging all the way to the other side and mm -hmm. so compromise is a pendulum swing whereas balance is getting right it's not trying to overcorrect to the other thing it's let's correct it and get where we need to be on the issue mm -hmm the truth and the spirit together yeah and i and i think that's the main distinguisher between the two um and it definitely manifests itself in your personal walk uh without a doubt well i i'm gonna be careful about how i, I make this next statement because I, I don't want anybody just to be thinking i'm i'm pointing at any specific person because it happens a lot but there are a lot of men who are in the ministry whose fathers were in the ministry and their fathers were great men, great uh, Bible believing fundamentalist leaders. And as they got out from under their father's ministry and, and went their own way, a lot of them ended up in that state of overcorrection. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you know, as far as the analogy, that's some of the most dangerous accidents that happen on the road is when someone overcorrects. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of car wrecks out there in, in the ministry because of men who, instead of trying to slowly find where they needed to be, overcorrected and they're laying in the other ditch. Absolutely. So let me uh, get this. One of the kings in the Old Testament he got hurt in the house of God. He, he wasn't supposed to be messing with the altar and he, he came up hurt in the house of God, ran away. His son never went into the house of God. Uh, when you watch your parents get hurt, it's easy to overcorrect. And when you overcorrect, you claim balance. Yeah. Well, my parents just were all in and they got hurt. And so I just don't want to, well, no, no, no. The balance is somewhere in the middle. It's not either extreme. And that is the key. Yeah, I really believe that. Amen. Uh, here's Gabriel Gonzalez. He said, understanding that within the IFB, there are different camps with which we need to find the good in each and find balance among them. But do you also think this should extend farther out to the modern church movement and perhaps 
other denominations that have an area down better than we do. Well, Brother Gabriel, uh, we're Baptist, and so I don't know anybody who's doing it better than we are. So, no, I, I'm just kidding. What do you think about that, Brother Caleb? Um, I think that in some ways the the broad brush answer to this has to be yes. Now, I think you have to be very careful in saying that. Uh, you'll get crucified for saying that. But the reality is um, there are there are some good things about other other places. But here's what I would encourage you, um, Gabriel, on is this. There are also good churches that are doing it well and doing it right that you could observe from. And yeah. and instead of what my generation is doing, what our generation is doing, uh, Brother Randy, is we are looking outside of the fold way more than um, perhaps we ever have. But but we don't even realize how many good churches there are all across this country that God has. I mean, that was the one thing about Twitter that I liked is I was constantly coming up on good churches that in the middle of nowhere, running hundreds of people, not that you have to, trust me, my church isn't big, but running hundreds of people that you've never heard of before going, man, God's got more than 7,000 in this country, yeah. you know, that haven't bowed the knee and they're doing it and they believe like us and they're, they try to have a right spirit and, and preach the right truth. And, and that's exciting to me to see so many that are doing it. And so I don't think you have to go outside nearly as much as we claim to. Mm -hmm. um, one of the ways that we're going outside of, I think it's an imbalance is, uh, in our movement is we have gone to the business world to, to show us how to lead God's people. And, and I just think that's an imbalance that we have currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. And, uh, uh, you, you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to spend too much time talking about this whole ordeal with the coronavirus because that's all people are seeing. But, um, you know, the first thing that I hear out of everybody um, when this came about is they're checking with lawyers. What do the lawyers say? What's the lawyer's opinion? I mean, mm -hmm. well, we, we've got prayer, we've got a Bible and we've got 2000 years of church history to draw from. Um, so I, I'm not saying I'm not I'm not faulting at this point anybody's handling of this. However, you handled that is between you and the Lord. But what I am saying is that that there is a place that we could have went to first. <laughs> and, sure. and that should have been prayer in the scripture. Absolutely. Do you so, do you think that um, do you think that that the the necessity of of everyone doing it our way is um is a key contributor to our imbalance um I mean, you're 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 asking if for example if somebody's not doing it my way if i think they're imbalanced yes uh in most cases, I think, yeah, I think that's where we get to. And it's hard. It's really hard to take a step back and and absorb the full picture, especially once we've dug in on it and especially once it's become public. Yes, sure. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that there is a key component to being um, just a man of God. I don't mean a preacher. I just mean somebody that that, you know, is trying to love the Lord and do right. Um, is we ought to be the first, we ought to be the leaders in our example to our flock. And, and what an opportunity the coronavirus is to, to, to exemplify for our people an opportunity for us as the leaders, what submission looks like. But at the same time, what a stand looks like. Because there are certain things that we can submit on and there are certain things that we're not going to uh, stand for. You know, we, we have sure. to take a stand and and we do that in knowing that that it doesn't matter which decision we make. We're going to be, you know, accosted for it. And it's yeah. going to be, uh, you know, it, that's just the truth of it, that we're going to nobody's going to think we made the right decision regardless of which decision we make. Sure. 
And I do think that it is showing just how much uh, imbalance that we have in our in our daily life by how much uh, we have how this is has thrown us off kilter. So that's one of the things about balance that I think people need to understand. And that is, if you are not balanced, you cannot absorb a blow. When you absorb a blow, it, it, it makes you fall. But when you are properly balanced, you're better able to absorb a blow. Mm -hmm. and, and going through storms in life, you know, it's easy to live like a Christian and to live in church and do right and everything when everything's wonderful. And every message you hear is the best message you've ever heard. And, you know, everybody loves you and it's all wonderful at your job and your family and everything. But it's through the storms that our obedience is tested and we learn obedience through the things we suffer. Sure. And it's balance that's going to make us, you know, pass us through that. Amen. Well, I, I've got a thought and it's somewhat related to the subject. I, I'll just mention it. We'll move on because, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of study now. Fortunately. Uh, you know, I've not been in a position personally where I've had to make the hard decisions. Um, I do believe I, I know what I would do if, if I was in the situation uh, of being a pastor still. But um, what what kind of hit me this week is it, it's very easy in our flesh to seek to rebel uh, against something, um, you know, good or bad. Sure. You know, the the church has always flourished under persecution. Uh, and so in the flesh, it, it's very easy to, to make that stand. But it hit me in my studies this week that when when we are doing something that even is perceived as civil disobedience, we as Christians are, are never seeking to be disobedient. We're just seeking to be obedient to the highest power, the highest authority. And so I think if we're trying to look at it as finding a place where we can be disobedient and feel that that fleshly desire to be disobedient, then we're looking at it the wrong way. We're trying to figure out to whom at what point should we be obedient? I agree. And, with that. Uh, yeah. And it, it's got to be it's got to be pretty bad. Um to cross certain lines of authority. You know, when I was pastoring, if I had to deal with, you know, if I had a problem with a woman in the church and, and there was a time that I did, I had a, a bad problem with a, a woman in my church um, causing a lot of trouble. When I dealt with it, I did not go directly to her. I went to her husband and her because scripturally he's her head. He's her authority. And, uh, you know, biblical authorities, when they're meshing, they shouldn't cross each other. They shouldn't harm one another. Absolutely. And, but I, I would say this, um, you know, if, if I was trying to lord over the flock of God, if I was trying to take possession of something that wasn't mine, by all means, that woman should have in every instance followed her husband over what I said. So, you know, just just a, a few thoughts on authority there. Uh, and that does bring us to our next question. I forgot to put these up on the screen, but uh, this one from newlywed Justin Childers. Uh, good question. Uh, is that newlywed? He is a newlywed. Uh, he's Amen. not been he's not been married that long. So congratulations to uh, Brother Justin Amen. and his wife. Uh, he said, how about marital balances? How much should a husband allow his wife to disagree with him? How far should a wife follow her husband down a bad road? That's a great question. Um, as yes, far as the district, <laughs> another newlywed, Brother Randy. Uh, yes. Want to answer? Yeah. Um, one of my wife's not here at the church. Well, right I need to now. go She's tell my wife not. to watch. Uh, uh, and, and actually, I need to wait and see what your answer is. Then I'll go tell her to watch the recording. <laughs> Yeah, you might you might not want to. You might want to hold off just a minute. Um, and and here's why uh, we're we're likening this relationship according to Ephesians five. The picture is of Christ in the church, correct? Yes, Amen. All right, and so we're supposed to love our wife like Christ loved the church, and I believe that that means that He loved us first. 
pure in his love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us, um, amongst other things. But, but so we see that we ought to, as the men, we ought to be resembling Christ and his love for the church. But I also think that we can get a picture of what Christ allows from the church in this. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, obviously it was, it was prior to Calvary and I, and I get all of that, but, but Peter took him and rebuked him and said, get, you know, uh, not so Lord. And then Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, that's as close to an argument that you're going to find in scripture with Jesus having, you know, I mean, with somebody there, that, that's kind of the, the closest thing you're going to find. But uh, Peter said, was that, is that first Peter three? Um, likewise. And, and that likewise, the wives uh, giving reverence to their husband, that first Peter three or second Peter three, it's got to be first Peter three. Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands. Well, if you go back to what the likewise is there, uh, Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example in the last chapter. And um, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself uh, to the judge, to him that judgeth righteously. So he allowed himself to be done wrong. And, and like he did, we ought to allow for God to deal with it. Uh, the wife to the to the uh, to the husband, and then it also says, "Likewise, ye husbands." In verse seven, dwell with them according to knowledge. That's still like Christ dwell, you know, um, back in the last chapter. So, if that's the understanding, verse number uh, is it fifteen? No, verse number thirteen. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors. Uh, Verse 18 says, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. So uh, so it does go a long way uh, on the on the, the side of the spouse. But here's where uh, counseling comes in with balance. You, you deal with the wife from the wife's perspective, but you deal with the man from the man's perspective. Yes. You know, you're yep. not going to tell the man, well, she ought to be submitting to you. No, you ought to tell the man whether she submits to you or not. You need to love her like Christ loved the church. Mm -hmm. And you need to tell the wife, regardless of how he treats you, you have a responsibility to God to represent him and his church to your husband. Yeah, that's exactly right. I was actually going to go there. I'm glad that, that you did. Um, it, it's kind of a matter of staying in your own lane, so to speak. Uh, because, you know, you as a man, uh, you're going to give an account to God for how you treated your wife. And your wife is going to give an account to God for how she treated and, and reacted to you. Uh, you. You know, growing up in some of the circles that I was involved in, uh, I was involved a lot with some of the camp meeting crowd. And, you know, guys would get up and kind of brag about how, how tough they were and, you know, how that they treated their wife. And there was a guy here, uh, lives about an hour from me. And he talked about how he made his wife walk behind him, two steps behind him all the time. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was a bad situation. But, uh, you, you know, it was that, that spirit, well, I'm going to force her to do this. I, I'm going to force her you know, and eventually you, you wake up one day and, and unfortunately for him, I'm, I'm not taking any joy in this, but unfortunately for him one day he did wake up and he wasn't going to force her to do anything anymore because she was tired of it and she left. So, you know, you, you do have to have to stay in your own, own lane to a degree, but I, I think it goes back and, and you can correct me if you disagree with me, brother Caleb. Yes. She she needs to follow uh, to the point that that she just absolutely for conscience sake could not no more. And that should be a mighty high line. Uh, absolutely. You know, if he's commanded yeah. her just to blatantly sin. OK, come on. Uh, yeah. She has a responsibility to God. But yeah, as, as much as lieth in thee, live, pe live peaceably with all men. Um, we ought to do good to all men, especially they are the household of faith. Uh, so how much more your own household, you know, uh, the balance of a relationship. You want the balance of a relationship. It's 1 Corinthians 7, 4. Um, 
First Corinthians seven, I'm sorry, three, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Mm -hmm. Again, you see the order there. The, uh, the husband is supposed to render to the wife. It's, it, it deals with that first because of the authority that you talked about, but also the wife rendering to the husband due benevolence. And so, uh, so that due benevolence, that kindness that they're owed is what that's saying. Yeah. Amen. Um, so, and that's because of God, not because of them. Sure. Well, we have Josh Schuster here. Josh Schuster said, my wife was arguing with me once and I said, get thee behind me, Satan. Didn't turn That's out awesome. well. Well, <laughs> his next statement is JK. So apparently his wife came in the room right after he typed that. <laughs> and by the way, um, from your profile, here's your wife. I am watching. <laughs> Amen. So, so ho hope you answered right there, brother. All right, yeah. let's go ahead and, and move on to the next question. We got. Uh, well, before we get off this topic, go yeah, back, go ahead. Go back to that that Eric Knight said the last thing, um, because it's in reference to this. Because I do agree that, um, and, and here's how. Here's the example in First Peter three is Abraham and Sarah. He lied and she followed. God took care of it though, um, because. I, I really believe that that how this thing works is, is that the uh, authority that God has established will give an account for every man's soul. Right. And then we give an account in and, and, and our subjection as to whether or not we submitted to our authority. Um, I think that a, a mother will give an account of her parenting for whether or not she submitted herself to her husband's parenting desire. And I believe that the father is the one who will give an account for the parenting of the home. And I think that she could uh, she could parent right, but still be wrong. Hmm. Because Amen. she didn't submit. And that is why it's such an important issue, um, because it's not. See, submission, number one, is never when you agree. That's agreement. Submission is always when we have to humble ourselves like Christ did. Yeah, and, it's a, and it's a willful thing. Um, you can force someone to be in subjection to you, but you have to, you have to uh, voluntarily submit. Yes. And, 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 you know, uh, we used to, you know, say uncle, say uncle. You can, you can administer all the pain you want, but if somebody's not going to submit, you can break their arm and you might subject them from, you know, keep them from doing whatever, but they haven't submitted until their will has been released to do what you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It, it reminds me, I, I worked uh, at a certain place. I, I won't, I won't say on here, but uh, I was working for a guy. And the reason I'm not saying is because he was very hard to work for. Um, and, and he was a Christian fella, extremely hard to work for. He and I got along better than anybody else, though. And the reason that we did is because I just did what he said. Um, he was my boss. And, and you know, he, he never asked me to do anything immoral or illegal or anything like that. But, uh, you know, if he asked me to do something, even if it was the hardest way possibly to get it done, I did it the way he told me to do it. And I had somebody asked me there once and they always kind of gave me a hard time. You know, you're the boss's pet type stuff. And um, they're like, how do you get along with this guy so well? How do you put up with it? I said, he's the guy who signs my check. I do what he says and he likes it. So, uh, you know, I, I was never a yes man for the guy. If he asked me my opinion, I gave it to him, but he was my authority. And, and when he wanted something done, I may have known 20 ways easier to do it but I still did it the way he wanted. And uh, it, it made for a good work relationship. All right. Uh, yes, Todd Thompson says, what you guys think an out of balance preacher looks like and where is the line he crosses to get out of balance? Um, I'm having a hard time hearing you. It's a lot of uh, uh, echoey uh, mechanical sound. Okay, hold, hold on. Let me get my. I don't that know that that's not. I say that again. 
Is that better? It's a lot better. Okay. My phone was too close to my microphone. Uh, oh. Okay. Let me read it one more time. What do you guys think an out of balance preacher looks like and where is the line he crosses to get out of balance? Um, so I think this, this brings about a twofold thing. Uh, and that is that there are multi facets or mul multiple different way or ways or areas that we need to be balanced in at the same time. Um, for example, uh, you know, there is a, a huge raging uh, debate over uh, topical versus, um, you know, uh, my mind just went blank. Uh, Expository. Ex yeah, expositional preaching. Um, and, and you can get out of balance on that real quick either way. Um, but that's not the only thing that you ought to be worried about being balanced in. Um, you ought to be balanced in whether or not you're preaching the word of God or just your own stories. You ought to be balanced in, you know, I mean, and, and, and here's the thing that's hard is there are different personalities in the pulpit and it's okay because Christ in you means that there's still you that Christ is in and it's going to show up and it's, and he knows that there's always going to be some of us. And so, sure. so we have to be careful just claiming other people's balance or out of balance, I think might be, might be foolhardy sometimes on our part, but, um, I do think an out of balance preacher, uh, just to answer the question, uh, somebody who is all one way or another, you know, if, even if it's all love, that's out of balance. If it's all positive, it's out of balance. If it's all negative, it's out of balance all grace or all law out of balance, uh, all truth and no excitement about it. Um, you know, all, all application and all, um, all, all real practical stuff, but no doctrine is another area that you can get out of balance in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, so I think, I think it's, it's hard to, uh, just say one specific line, brother Todd, um, but, but it definitely will manifest itself. I think a key, if you hear somebody that every week you get up and you hear the same thing coming out of their mouth, whether that's about the Bible, whether it's about a uh, politician or whether it's about fill in the blank football, you know, whatever it's about, if they're always talking about the same thing, it's a pretty good indicator that man, that's, there ought to be more than this. You know, I like, sure. I, I like, uh, you know, lasagna, but I don't want to eat it every night for 25 years. <laughs> yeah, amen. I could probably so, make it a couple of months, though. I really like lasagna. But, <laughs> I, but at some point, you, you grow tired of it being the same thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there was this fella that I met not too long ago, and he was a, a real pain in the neck to deal with. Um an older preacher and, uh, you know, just, just a hard guy to get along with. Um, and we were talking and, uh, you know, he, he was, I, I, I'm not sure what his problem was, but, you know, constantly rebuking all of us guys sit around talking to him. And it was just a conversation. I, I mean, like you and I, like if, if you called me on the phone, I spent all night telling you how wrong you were. That that's the scenario we were in. And so, you know, we, we're talking to this guy, but he did say something. He actually said several things I did take away from that conversation that I found in, in constructive criticism that were very good. One of the things that he mentioned was the importance of being an illustrator in, in your preaching. And, um, you know, for years, I've leaned heavily towards the other direction. Uh, you know, I, I could sit here and, and talk you know, 30, 45 minutes easy on a variety of biblical subjects, but it, it's just, uh, you know, to the average hearer would be dry. Whereas some guys could take that same subject and just has the right story, you know, the right thought that makes that come alive. And Jesus himself was a, an amazing illustrator. You know, he was a storyteller. And so, you know, we do see the balance there with Christ as far as him being able to utilize stories or, or parables, if you will, to to communicate his points, to communicate doctrine. And, you know, I found personally for me, that was a, an area that I was a little bit weaker in. 
And, and I think, though, the problem is, especially guys who are on my side of the line, that, you know, we're, we're big on study, we're big on pulling out doctrine and, and dealing with, you know, hard issues that aren't usually dealt with, that, you know, we neglect some of the practicalities and we also neglect some of the methods that can be used to really illustrate a point, really drive it home. Solomon, the wisest man outside of Jesus that ever walked the earth, spoke of trees and birds and nat natural things. He observed nature and then spoke of it, spoke on it in his wisdom. Uh, mm -hmm. There's great wisdom. Jesus did the same thing. You know, a sower went forth to sow, uh, you know, all those kind of things. He, he absolutely used very natural uh, occurring events and spoke on them. Um, so, so, so here's where, here's the easiest way to get out of balance about it. You, you, you don't want to, or, or, you know, just your, your, your nature isn't to give great illustrations or a ton of illustrations. So when you're sitting there listening to a man who's really good at giving illustrations, go, this ain't preaching. Yes. Yes. And, exactly. and, and that's, and that's out of balance because, because the Lord can absolutely use that type of preaching just as much as he can use yours. It yes. is always safest to use the word of God to explain the word of God. But it Agreed. doesn't mean, yes. but it doesn't mean that men who are using practical or personal life stories or events aren't doing the same thing. And God can use both of it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Your pastor can oh. tell a story. Oh, yeah. Yes, he can. And he yes. uses comedy very well. And God uses yeah. it. My pastor can tell a story. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. But I'm not my pastor, nor has he ever asked me to be. In fact, he's done the exact opposite. Um, you know, he's always said to us that came out of Happy Valley, you know, you're not Eddie White. You're not supposed to be Eddie White. Don't try to be Eddie White. Go be who God has for you to be. Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, we've got a few more questions. I, I'm going to try and knock all these out and uh, I'm going to get to one before we close. Um, we'll go. We'll try and wrap it up. Nine forty nine fifty somewhere in there. Uh, maybe we might even push it a little bit closer to 10. But uh, there's some good questions. I at least want to get what we've got in so far, though. So let's um, let's be as concise and move quickly through these as possible. There's just okay. a few left. Uh, so I've got one from John Beam, and he says, would you say the devil deals in extremes? Yes. The Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he'll curse thee to thy face. His man mindset and his mentality is, you do something to him, he's not going to want anything to do with you. It's an extremism position for sure. Hmm. It absolutely is. Never really thought about it before. That's a good thought. That is an Old Testament principle, by the way. The law is that way. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Hmm. The law was, was that way. Extreme justice. But covered by mercy. Hmm. Amen. Well, that was thought. the balance of the Old Testament. So, yes, I do think the devil deals in extremes. Probably not as concise as I should have been. I apologize. No, that was good. I, I just I don't really have anything more to contribute. Uh, good, good, uh, good answer there, brother. All right. Uh, our next one. And, and no, that that was perfect length. Um, comment from Brother Charlie Gray. He says, I've had to keep in check that rebellious spirit during this time. Yes. Amen. So uh, can I just tell you, I was working um, in uh, Missouri on my brother's house during all this nonsense. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where we wound up getting stuck at. And, uh, and so I was sequestered in the middle of the Ozarks in the woods. The only county in Missouri still doesn't have a case of the virus. You know, we were as safe and far away from people as you could get. And uh, and my county back here in Trinidad put some extreme uh, policies in place. In fact, they're stronger in my county that only has three cases of the virus than our entire state that has hundreds. Wow. And I, there was something in me that wanted to drive home then and there just to be a burr in there under their saddle. But yeah. I knew that was the wrong approach. But that's how quickly our flesh can throw this thing out of balance for sure. Yes. Yeah. Amen. All right. Uh, Neela Montero says this. This is a, a good comment on what we've talked about earlier. She said, I heard this from a pastor. Husbands love your unsubmissive wives and wives submit to your unloving husbands. Uh, amen to that. All amen. right. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping one because I want to save it for the end. But going back to Brother Chip Party, he says Eastern countries seem to have a good handle on practical balance. Are we missing some of that in the West? Uh, I know Brother Grady talked quite a bit about, you, you know, like, the, for example, the Japhethite mindset versus the Shemite mindset. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, I would say that outwardly it would appear that way, although I've spoken to many, um, many missionaries in um, Asian and Eastern uh, the Middle East, you know, countries, and they say that there are schisms everywhere because the reality is, is you're always going to have schisms when you have people who are spiritual babies and there's not supposed to be. Mm. Well, uh, I'll say this now. I don't know anything about e- Eastern countries per se. Um, uh, I have been as far as that direction, I've been to the Philippines, I've been to Israel, I've spent some time in both those places. And I, I did see what, what you're saying, dealing with um, Christian babies, people who've not been saved long, or even people who have been saved a while that just haven't done much growing. And, uh, you know, in being in both of those places, I, I think maybe maybe unless you just know someone there, Brother Chip, but the people that I knew and that I was around seemed to have some of the same problems that we deal with and even problems on different levels. Uh, Brother Grady talks about uh, the Shemite and Japhethite mindset. And really when when you're dealing with people in in that part of the world, a lot of the people with the the Shemite mindset, um, that they're not as practical as they are spiritually minded. And I'm not talking about spiritual in a good Bible way, like the Holy Spirit. Um, that's why, you know, during during wars, we, we had a lot of trouble, you know, when we were fighting against Japan. Um, we had to take special measures in, in order to deal with some of them because they would hype themselves up so much that we had to take more extreme measures. And as a matter of fact, my understanding, that's why the 45 caliber was designed because, uh, you know, they'd fight those wars and they would shoot somebody up and they'd still come and kill two or three guys. Mm. Uh, they had to have something with some knockdown power. So I, I'm not sure, brother. I, I don't really have a lot of knowledge on, and I'm not sure if you just mean Eastern as far as maybe Eastern European or more, more Shemite. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm not really experienced, but the ones that I have dealt with um, a little bit farther and Middle East, uh, they seem to have a lot of the same problems that we do. We're just here and they're there. Well, I'll say three things quickly. Number one, people are people everywhere. Um, number two, maturity allows for others to do things a different way and it still be okay. And immaturity always has to be my way. So as long as you have immature people, both physically and spiritually, you're always going to have that. No, if it's not done the way we're doing it, then it's not done right. Um, That mentality. But thirdly, I will say this, famine will make you eat more. Mm -hmm. And the uh, if you have no other brethren, you tend to overlook more of their faults. 
one of the dangers of especially the southeastern part of the country that we live in is that there are churches on every corner so we don't have to get along with everybody right yeah but when you come out even just out west here brother randy you know where we are um yeah. there there's there's not another independent baptist church that i'm aware of in my entire county um and and that is that is uh Oh, 4,775 square miles, I think it was, in my county. That's a lot of, that's a lot of place. Yes. Um, and so, needless to say, we're, we're a long ways from a lot of different people. And so, you know, maybe they're not just like us um, in everything, but, but you'll befriend somebody because famine makes you, want, makes you hungry. Sure. Well, Caleb Hickam, and I think he said it when we were all together, I always refer back to it fondly as the fishing revival because uh, we, we fished in the day and preached at night. It, it was a good meeting at, out at your place. And Andrew was uh, preaching for Bobby Johnson. But I remember we're standing there ar around those little uh, trout lakes fish and Caleb looks over and he says, you know, brother Andy out here where there's nobody to fellowship with. If the Antichrist would host us, we'd fellowship with him. <laughs> and so I, I understand the sentiment. Uh, and, and guys who are watching from out west understand it uh, as well. But, yeah, you're right. Around here where I'm at, we don't have to get along with people. <laughs> uh, Andy Tucker, Pastor Andy Tucker from up in Ekron, Kentucky. Love Brother Andy. He says that sounds like a perfect argument for carrying my 45. I agree. There you go. I used to have a sticker on my guitar case that said, I carry a 45 because they don't make a 46. Uh, <laughs> I carried that uh, 45. I, I was, I probably shouldn't say this online, but uh, I was 18 years old. And I was preaching in South Carolina and a man drove me to his house and gave me my first pistol. It was a 45. I carried that thing everywhere I went. I strapped it to my ankle and it was like dragging a cinder block around, but that, that was my first pistol. Uh, okay. So he, here's a few more. I, I do want to get to these. There are, are good questions. Sister Glenda from in China says, how about modesty? What about balance on modesty? Now that is, that's something I grew up around that could be, that could swing very widely just depending on who you are around. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I, I will say this. Um, I don't, I don't, maybe I'll get crucified uh, for it, but I'll say this. Uh, I think we need to be very careful trying to declare what articles of clothing are or are not modest by their article of clothing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is unwise because I think you can have a modest shirt and an immodest shirt. And I yes. think you have to be very careful just saying that all shirts are modest or all shirts are immodest. And you can apply that anywhere you want to. And you can run into the same problem or the same issue. Um, yeah. You know, I, in dealing with clothes, I'll tell you one that uh, the, the modesty thing, but just also preachers, Brother Randy, this is one that I, the balance on this is hard for me. Um, if, if, if I know a guy is, uh, you know, has always been, you know, suit and tie preacher, um, he's always been that way. And now he's like, you know, jeans and a, and a dress shirt untucked with a with a with a blazer and no tie yeah. and kind of just wanting to to push the boundaries. I don't like it, but I have no problem with a man coming in in a, a pair of blue jeans and or, uh, overalls and a white collar, you know, a white shirt underneath them and preaching. Uh, so so that's a balance issue. That's a, that's a hypocrisy that I have to you know work through. You know what I mean? Like a, a, a cowboy coming in in a bolo tie is not it. it you just have to that you need more balance is what I'm saying, uh, sure. even in that area. Uh, modesty, though, uh, again, what I will say is, is I believe about clothing that it's there for two purposes. It's supposed to cover our form and it's supposed to cover our flesh. And the more of each that it does, the better. Um, and so so I believe that that clothing is for covering. And we're supposed to cover our form and flesh. And I think that the balance of it is that we uh, focus on what we're supposed to do and quit worrying about or declaring what someone else is based on what they're doing. 
Yeah, amen. Uh, I will agree with that. Um, and I was actually, okay, somebody just put another comment that made me laugh. I'll put that up first. Chip Party said, uh-oh, Sluter just had a fit. You're exactly right, brother Chip. He, he's going to have a stroke wherever he's at. He, he probably don't even have to watch. He just feels the broadcast, the waves rippling through his soul, and it, he's angry now. Uh, Andrew but, Tucker. But brother Randy, let me just say, though, that yes. um, – that if I'm somewhere and they ask me not to wear a shirt and tie to preach, they specifically say, you know, here, can you wear a whatever? I will, I will submit myself to their authority. Yeah, but, but given the chance, I will preach in a shirt and tie and somebody, oh, you don't have to wear that. Well, I'm not wearing it for you. But I also don't think you have to, to be, I mean, Jesus never wore a shirt and tie. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be balanced on it or else we will quickly get out of balance. Bless yeah. God, nobody ever did anything for God without wearing a shirt and tie. Tell that to Paul. Tell it to Jesus, right? Like it, that's an imbalanced statement. But you can be balanced and only wear a shirt and tie to preach in. You, you just have to, you know, that and the spirit. I, one of these comments was dealing with the heart with Andrew Tucker. Yeah, I was getting the to that one. Spirit, yeah, that is absolutely the key. I, yes, I agree. She, uh, Brother Tucker said, my wife, and by the way, till Sister Jim, we said, hello. My wife told me that the more she grew closer to God, the more modest she chose to be. That makes a difference. Deal with the heart. And, and really, when we're talking about a lot of things in general, if we would start with the heart, uh, that's where these problems come from. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you a question, Brother Randy. Okay. There's two men standing here, both of them dressed the same way. One of them's coming from this position, headed that way, the wrong way, we'll say. The other one's coming from the wrong position, headed to the right way. Do you believe that at this exact point that God could be pleased with the one headed in the right direction and unpleased with the one headed in the wrong direction doing the same thing? Yes, um, I do too. And I think that's the balance issue. It, it was, it was, uh, I believe Jack Howells that said that he fellowships with a man based on where he's heading, um, mm. not necessarily where he's at. And uh, I, I think there's some wisdom to that. Um, you know, we should be trying to pull people the right direction. And uh, so, yeah, I, I do think there's some wisdom. And I think exactly what you're saying, because we have to allow room for growth, but there's a lot of guys who are, are backing up on positions that they've long held. Just like you said, they're, they're going the other direction and they're trying to justify everything they do along the way. Now, me personally, I, I don't mind a lot of things and, and I have a, a lot of grace or, or maybe grace is the wrong term. I have a lot of indifference towards a lot of things that people do. If, if someone puts a colored light in their church, I could honestly care less. I know a lot of my, my friends who are watching tonight, that's a big deal to them and, and they get really upset. But I will say this, when they start losing the tie, when they start changing the lights, when they start changing the music, okay, there's a lot of more changes to follow, generally, generally, generally. speaking. So, Absolutely. you know, it is the, the direction they're heading. So probably, one more comp go ahead. Pr probably my not, my most favorite uh, saying in reference to this has become when I look at people's ministries and what they're doing, I try not to say they should or should not do it. I try to say, I probably won't do it that way and leave it at that. <laughs> yes. Not whether I don't, I try not to make, try, you know, we're still flesh, but I try not to even make the determination of whether or not it is right or wrong, but rather, I don't think I'm going to do it that way and let God deal with them on whether or not it's right or wrong. Yeah, amen. Amen. Well, this is my favorite statement. If the tie is not on, the heart's wrong. <laughs> that, that's Chip Hardy. God bless you, brother. All right. Uh, here's, uh, <laughs> here's from your brother-in-law. Here's Micaiah. He says, what Micaiah. do you... Micaiah, Macaniah, I don't know. You, macaroni, as my kids call him, Uncle Macaroni. Uh, Uncle, you know, I have said his name, I don't know how many times, and I say it wrong literally every single time. 
He says, uh, what do you think are the main things a young preacher should know about the Bible, specific things that are vital for a preacher to learn and obtain? You're older than me, aren't you? I, I'm not sure. How old are you? Well, we're the same age. It's a matter of when your birthday is. October. Aren't you in the beginning? Oh, I'm older than you. Yeah, that's October right. 25th. It's Caleb that's the old man of the group. Caleb Hickam. Nobody believes that, but yes, Caleb yeah. Hickam is the old man of the group. I'm the 30th of June. You're in October? Yep. October that's 25th. Right. Yeah, you well, got I was going to uh, acquiesce to you because you're the older man, but I'm just going to acquiesce to you because he's my brother-in-law and wants to hear what you think. Okay. Uh, well, brother, I, I would say I'm going to tell you something. Uh, this issue that we're talking about uh, tonight, this is a big deal. I, I would say get a hold of this. Um, but in general, what you need to do is you just need to read your Bible and read it over and over and over and over again and let God speak to you. And if you want to use some commentaries for some hard things, that's fine, whatever. But reading commentaries is not reading the Bible. Um, you need to get yeah. in the Bible and you need to learn to pray. And, you know, if you'll do those things and you'll do your best to live by what that book says, a lot of things will work themselves out. So just get in the book. That's that's my advice. Follow the Lord. Spend time in prayer. And a lot of things will work themselves out. That's probably not the, the deep answer you're you're wanting, but uh, I found that to be true. Brother Adrian said, I enjoyed meeting Brother Adrian because uh, he bought me a cup of coffee. He said, Amen. Caleb Hewling, quit passing the buck. Answer the question. <laughs> All right, I'll answer him. Um, All right. I'll answer him. Uh, I, I honestly would say two things. Number one, fall in love with your Bible. If you're a young preacher, um, fall in love with your Bible. Number two, listen to preaching. A lot of it, a lot of different preaching. Um, and then, and then fall in love with prayer. You want to be a good preacher without being a good prayer? It won't happen. Uh, you might appear effective, but it's but it but to be a good preacher, you have to be a good prayer. Fall in love with the Bible, fall in love with prayer and allow God this uh, just this rule. Anything he says to you, I will obey. Anything he says, I'll obey. And you will grow into anything you need to be with those simple things. Mm -hmm. I agree 100 uh, percent. Chip Hardy says the broadcast was a blessing, a lot to absorb. I'm going to have to give it a second listen. Amen, Brother Chip. Honestly, Brother Caleb, I didn't know how tonight was going to go. I, I thought we may have to transition some, but uh, this has been a, a good discussion. I think it's been a needed discussion. Uh, Brother Tom Hatley, I, I want to get Brother Tom on eventually because you talk about a wealth of wisdom. Uh, this man, very intelligent, knows, knows a lot about the Lord, about the things of God, the Bible. He said that's the issue on change, the direction. I agree with and, that. I agree with that as well. Brother Tom Strong on uh, ecclesiastical separation and, and things of that nature. I, I really want to talk to you on the broadcast, Brother Tom. So hopefully some people will pastor you now that I've said it. Okay, here's the last question of the night. I saved this intentionally for last so that we can take just a few extra minutes. Let me see if I can find it back up in here. Dave Andrews, I believe he's way, up in Canada. Eric Knight, Eric Knight twice said, um, always wear a tie. Oh, in, in I, yes, comments. I see that. So that's always I, wear a tie. Amen. There you so go, I, I hate you want to know what a young man ought to, a young preacher ought to know. Always wear a tie. That's right. If the tie's not on, the heart's wrong. So I, I intentionally don't wear a tie when I, I do those broadcasts on Sunday and Wednesday. I hate ties. And it has nothing to do with the direction. I've just, I've always hated ties. So uh, anyway, yeah, I, whatever. If the tie's not on the heart strong, we'll stick with that for tonight. Dave Andrews, and I think Dave said earlier that he was from 
Canada, I think, Dave, if you're still with us. He said, is the day of the Lord the same as the day of Christ? This is our final question for tonight. So what do you think, brother? Mm, that's a great question. Have I you will, and I talked about this? Uh, it is. We have. Okay. We have. Um, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know. Truly, I'm undecided on that. Um, and and the reason why is the the day of Christ, of course, reference is Second Thessalonians two, right? Yeah, the day of Christ, Second Thessalonians two. So the uh, the 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 rest of that chapter goes on into the tribulation period. Um, as that the day of Christ is at hand for the day shall not come. So, and then he go, yeah, he goes on into the, the tribulation period. Agree or disagree so far? Uh, as far as order of the chapter, I, I'll agree with that. Yes. Yeah. The order of the chapter. Um, so, so just the, the, the initial thing you'd have to work through obviously would be, is that because the day of Christ is the, uh, is is dealing with the tribulation because uh, I personally think that the day of the Lord, uh, from my understanding so far, is um, is the the Battle of Armageddon and beyond, which ends the tribulation and ushers in the kingdom and that thousand year reign of Christ and then the Battle of Gog and Magog are all referenced as the day of the Lord through Scripture. Mm -hmm. um, so if they are the same thing, then I'm not sure how you how you deal with that part of it. Just personally, I just haven't I haven't really given this uh, the proper amount of study uh, to know. So I'm going to say that this is definitely better in your wheelhouse, and uh, and I'll challenge you where I disagree. Okay, all right. Uh, so Dave, here's here's what I believe about it, and I may do a, a video on it. And if I do, I'll, I've been preaching on Sunday and Wednesday nights after church, uh, and I'll post it on my page. I'll post it here uh, sometime in the future if we don't get it all covered tonight. But I believe that they are, in fact, the same thing. And the reason why is because we are specifically told in 2 Thessalonians 2 that this day, whatever this day is, the day of Christ, is not yet at hand. OK, because there are things that have to happen first. And, and Paul tells the people that he said that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So he says it's not at hand yet. Verse three, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except two things. There come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So Paul is saying that this day, the day of Christ, cannot come until these things happen first. There has to, number one, be a falling away, and number two, the Antichrist will be revealed. My thoughts on it are this, that the falling away is not taking place yet. Maybe we're experiencing the, the front of it, but I don't think the falling away is everybody leaving the fundamental church going down to the local cappuccino church necessarily. I think that the rapture is going to take place and that after the rapture, there are going to be many people who make some sort of a conversion, who make some sort of a change in their life because when the rapture takes place, it's not going to zap everybody's mind at the same time and they just forget everything they've been told their whole lives. There's going to be millions of people in America who are going to say, wait a second, my grandma talked about this rapture thing. And they're going to get in churches. Uh, they're going to try and make a change. But then there's going to be a falling away. You cannot neglect a falling away that takes place during the tribulation. It's exemplified during Christ's earthly ministry. He spoke about it. There's pictures of it. Um, Judas Iscariot, I think, is a, a perfect picture of the person falling away 
because in John chapter 17, Jesus said that he had them all. He had all of them, but Judas was lost, that he lost Judas and that Judas was lost for the fact of fulfilling scripture. So I think he's a type. There will be a falling away that takes place during the tribulation. So is that falling that, away for their Andrew directly connected to the children of Israel being required to spend three and a half years in the uh, wilderness of Revelation 12, and they're not supposed to go forth to the desert of Matthew well, 24 that I, we talked think, about, the be still yes. and know that I am God? I think there's high probability in that, but because think about this. I, I think the culmination of, of that falling away is going to be this. It's going to be taking the mark, in my opinion. That okay. that will be the culmination of it. Sure, okay? they would believe in those false Christs and those false prophets. Yes. And so, you know, Paul, of course, dealing with a Gentile church, though, from the Gentile perspective, that there are going to be many Gentiles saved during the tribulation. That's Revelation 7. There'll be a number which no man can number out of every tribe, kindred, tongue, and nation that comes forth. So there'll be many Gentiles saved. But think about it, Brother Dave. If you have all these people who make some sort of a profession, um, three and a half years in, a guy shows up and tells them, if you do not take the mark, then you can't buy or sell. Don't you think that there's going to be a mass exodus? on whatever faith that they held. I mean, look at well, just look at today. If you just told about people, to if you just told people today, you could go back to your everyday life right now, but you just could never go back to church. There'd be a lot of people take them up on that offer. Sure. Uh, you know, the government has pushed to the extremes, the idea that church is non-essential. The, the governor of New Mexico came out and spoke to faith communities and told them to stay at home. And then at the end of the video concluded with be sure and tell the kids that the Easter Bunny is going to be working on Sunday because they're essential. So whether whether it's something that is done intentionally, and I believe it is, or unintentionally, the narrative has continually been pushed that church is non-essential. So yeah, I, I think if I think if you gave people that option and things like this, what we've just dealt with are conditioning people for that moment. There was a county in Montana that said, unless you take a pink armband, that you cannot go into any stores and buy or do sell or do business. That's a county in Montana that did that. Now, do I think that's hmm. the mark of the beast? No, but I think it's conditioning people to take the mark of the beast. So I, I think, think that's, that's gonna... the balanced approach to what we're facing, Brother Randy, is, is this the thing? No. Is it setting it up for the thing? Maybe. Yes. Probably. Yeah, I could give you that. But do we know? Do we know what it's going to look like in the tribulation? The, the preachers who stand up and say, this is what's going to happen. I think that's an imbalance. Yes, I, I will agree with that. Yes. But does it so, does it look like it from our perspective that this thing is gearing toward that? A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah. But so, do we know? Do we know, though? I mean, can you just oh. stand up there and dogmatically say it? Probably not. Well, in the late 90s, when they start putting the U scans in in our supermarkets, you know, all we heard is here's the mark of the beast. That's so you can slide your hand across when you check out. And it may be. I don't know. But, you know, there's been a lot of things preached throughout the years. I can say this, though, whatever it's going to look like, there is going to be a mark and there is going to be a falling away that takes place. And there is going to be a revelation of the Antichrist. Now. You and I, I think from our past conversation may have disagreed a little bit on this, but I believe that this revelation is dealing with the midpoint of the tribulation. And I believe that because of how it appears that he's revealing himself, because it says that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God 
sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. These two things have to happen before the day of Christ happens. So that, I that's can my follow that. Yeah, so I can follow that. that that's why logically. I put them as a saying. Um, I, I had a lot of trouble for a lot of years with Second Thessalonians too, because it, you know if you're not careful, you'll put yourself three and a half years into the tribulation with Second Thessalonians too. Um, so. OK, so let me ask you a question just because I haven't quite got there yet. But but the immediate reference um, would be he that thou letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And that verse number six, ye, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So so we're into the tribulation three and a half years. What is that? So I'm, I'm going to tell you the traditional, um, well, the, the traditional, traditional is, that it's, is the Holy Ghost. Yeah, at the rapture. The day of Christ is the rapture. And, and, and so the Holy Ghost is gone. Right. So it, it does seem that, that this set of verses does have a little bit of transition in time. And, and you can call me out on this if you, you think I'm wrong or stretching it. But because of verse seven, because the mystery of iniquity doth already work. You know, Paul says, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. I told you this is how it's going to be. Verse five, verse six. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, and then shall that wicked be revealed. So is that when the Antichrist, I'm just, I'm just trying to follow you for sake of argument. Is that when the Antichrist is given power to overcome the, uh, the people of God, the saints of God? Uh, I'm not sure I'm tracking with you. Okay. Well, I'll have to find that verse then real quick. I apologize. Okay. Um, well, while you're looking for that verse, uh, let me just make one more statement about this as far as the day of Christ. Um, you know, for years, I like I said, I did struggle with this um, because I, I am pre-trib. And I always have been, that's always been my position and that's what was taught to me. But that doesn't mean that I did not challenge that position um, because I don't wanna believe anything just because it was taught to me. And, and so I studied it, man, that, that gave me a, a real hard time. And I'll tell you what, what flipped my thinking on it. It was an incorrect note by C.I. Schofield in his Bible, in his reference Bible. He said, that it was incorrectly translated. Now we know that's wrong. That anytime somebody says the King James Bible is wrong, incorrectly translated, there's a better rendering, whatever, we know that's incorrect. But I think his logic where he was trying to get to was correct. He was just using the wrong path to get there. He he, he mentioned that this should be the day of the Lord. Now, obviously it should be day of Christ, but when I equated the same two as the same thing, that made all the theological pieces just fall right where they should. Because the day of Christ is not, not at hand in second Thessalonians two, but in first Thessalonians, Paul tells us that the Lord is at hand. Right. He also tells so us. So Dave that Andrews asked, Dave Andrews said, it's the Antichrist that led it, that will be taken away. And that falls in line with where I'm at in Revelation 13, which is where I was getting to with the question that was that uh, the beast opens his mouth in blasphemy against God. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And he was given that uh, power for 42 months. Power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months which would be the middle of the tribulation. Yeah. And Daniel seven 
says that the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came. So it makes the direct reference there of, of this, him receiving this power, that power was given to him to overcome the saints. Um, now to me, that is a great verse, one of the best verses to me as to why the believer in the tribulation doesn't have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And he's given power to overcome the saints in the tribulation. Yeah. Well, now, I that taught. Also, just for argument's sake, because me and Eric Knight were having this discussion earlier, um, is I'm a, I'm a bit more moderate than probably you are in my understanding of dispensationalism. And uh, he's a bit more moderate even than I am. And, uh, and, and so that would be a great point in case for why First John, that reference in First John would not be tribulation um, doctrine. Mm, I see. Well, if, if people want to take the time, Dave, if you want to take the time um, just to kind of track with what we're saying, um, a few weeks ago, I, I preached one night about the wolf in, in John chapter 10. And, you know, in John chapter 10, we have several characters, but two of those characters, I, I think, are the same person displayed with different demeanors, so to speak. We have the idle shepherd, who the Bible tells us the idle shepherd flees when the wolf comes. Well, idle shepherd or now I'm using Isle Shepherd. That's actually a quote from the Old Testament. I meant the hi uh, hireling flees when the wolf comes. Um, that's a direct reference, though, to the Old Testament where we have the idle shepherd who leaves the sheep. And idle shepherd is not I-D-L-E as far as a lazy shepherd. Idle shepherd, it's I-D-O-L. And if you'll trace that chapter, it's a direct reference to the Antichrist. It even talks about him being wounded in the right eye, the right arm. And so we have the idle shepherd there who leaves the sheep. If in fact that is connecting to the hireling of John 10, well, the wolf would also have to be the antichrist. The sheep that the wolf is tormenting in John 10 are not Gentile sheep, they're Jewish sheep. Jesus doesn't even mention the Gentile sheep until later, the sheep I have of another fold. But the wolf comes and he scatters the flock and bites and devours some of them. He, he kills some of the flock. And we know that about uh, two thirds of the Jews are gonna be annihilated during the tribulation. So I think when we're dealing with John chapter 10, we see that we see almost a dual nature of the antichrist. For years, prophecy guys have presented the Antichrist as coming in as a more peaceful demeanor and then, you know, flipping and just going, going crazy, killing and setting himself up as God. We see the same thing with Judas Iscariot, who the Antichrist will at least have the spirit of Judas, if not be Judas in the flesh. Um, Judas Iscariot, the same way never really a good guy. He, he's always been a thief. He always has carried the bag. But that night that he betrayed Jesus, there was something demonic that took place. So for what it's worth, that might be something to look into. And that, that actually may correlate with what you're saying, if I'm, if I'm tracking correctly uh, on your thoughts in 2 Thessalonians 2. That he that leteth is the... Uh we'll say the peaceful one yes that's taken out of the way and then the beast who's given power from the dragon will come in and that dragon's whole purpose is to destroy the woman that gave the seed yes which is the jewish people yes well, i can follow that uh, i'll have to study it out but i can follow it for sure and i think it that's what we're seeing sense. in john 10. i i think i think that's what's there that's an interesting consideration so well, brother, I, I'm glad we ended on that one because uh, I, I know that I, that the people who normally watch wanted to, us to get into a little bit of it, but uh, maybe we can get on 
uh, sometime down the road and hash some of these things out. It's been a good broadcast. It's uh, yeah. 10, 15, well, so I, we went over, but I've enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for being on. God bless you, brother. All righty, take care. All right, folks, if, if you've not liked the page yet, be sure and like the page. Like and share the broadcast, but like the page. That way, every week, you can see the broadcast. Uh, Caleb Hickam also puts on Baptist History. Uh, every Monday, he does a Baptist History podcast and a missionary podcast. It's fantastic. It's entertaining. You'll learn something along the way. Um, I have also been putting on some videos. Brother Andrew has as well. So like the page. You'll be notified every time that something drops. But uh, I believe that's it for tonight. God bless you, Brother Caleb. Thank you for joining us. Amen, brother. God bless you.